subscribe to our youtube channel for in-depth interviews of india inc and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates Hello and welcome to Denmark Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hirad Dadia. We have with us Mr. Kamlesh Gandhi, founder, chairman, and MD at MAS Financial Joining. And welcome to the show, Mr. Gandhi. And always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, my first question coming to you is: We've been in business over the last 25 years, and I think this is one of the first times where we've come into a situation due to COVID. Uh, if you could just help us understand with regards to Q4 earnings as well. Have they met your expectations, taking into consideration how the full year has been? So thank you. Uh, coming to your first question of uh, 25 years of India years is an unprecedented time, and what we have learned over all these years that fundamentals makes a lot of difference. If you have seen over the last one one and a half year, what we have focused upon is on the strength of the balance sheet rather than just worrying about a quarterly result or a quarterly profit. And strength of the balance sheet meaning that we have maintained our capital adequacy more than 25 percent, created sufficient buffers, had sufficient liquidity, and at the same time, at a, all given opportunity, have capitalized to increase our disbursements also. So, if you see in Q4, what was the thousand crores in Q3, we could do around 1300 crores in Q4, and that is where we ended up with 143 crores of a pad, which is uh, around. Uh, uh, close to 13% of contraction over the previous year. But I think we will agree that these two years are not comparable. Mm -hmm. And the quarterly basis, we had a pad of uh, close to around 36 crores. And on the collection efficiency, we were fortunate to see a good uh, uh, normalization in Q4. We all thought that we have, so we have crossed this challenge of COVID almost. We have met it before we really met with an unfortunate second wave the things were also normal on collections almost to the pre-COVID level. So on Q4, uh, we got an opportunity for higher disbursements and uh, on the asset quality, uh, it is around 1.53% of our net uh, AUM with a buffer of 1.39 as COVID provisioning, which is not dipped into at all. Uh, I would like to bring your notice that we are not dipped into COVID provisioning because while uh, finalizing, we started experiencing the second wave, and we thought that uh, it's just prudent to have a management overlay for the same. Correct. Absolutely. So with this, you know, uh, as you mentioned about collections, now in the month of April, due to the second wave, the collection efficiency dipped from 96% to 92%. Now, are you expecting the first quarter of FY22 to be slightly weak on the collection front? Because the second wave has lasted April, May. Uh, we don't know how, how good or bad June is going to be. Definitely. See, we work uh, at a marketplace and we are not immune to what is happening at a marketplace. And this has been all pervasive, so to say. Unlock, undeclared lockdown that the, many of the states had declared a lockdown of their own, but the activities were almost at halt. So in April, it was 92%. We are watching very closely what will happen in May and June. But uh, as we visualize right now, I think there will be definitely a dip in collections as for this quarter because there has been no working, so to say. But having said that, our experience for the last COVID uh, over, the, over the year has shown that our borrowers are the ones being the small ticket size borrowers are the ones who can come back to normalization the fastest. And because of our distribution strength, whereby we work uh, uh, directly with 3,000, uh, directly 3,500 centers and also use NVFCs as many as more than 100 NVFCs, uh, whereby we align on our uh, product distribution, we get a cushion of them also buffering the shortfall in collection. So what looks like around uh, normal 90 to 95% might look uh, at around 85 to 90%. This is what we presume right now, but difficult to give the exact number. Mm, right. And overall, you know, the rejection rate has increased as well from say 20, 25%, which was in pre-COVID to 40, 45% now. When do you see this normalizing and is, is taking lesser risks the main reason why we've uh, increased the rejection rates? It's combination of both. So lending is a lending is a business of confidence. It's not only about the about the numbers you get on the paper. 
So that plays a very important role in the minds of the risk managers and the credit managers when it comes to disbursing loans. And secondly, the cash flows of the borrowers with whom we are working will be disturbed. There will be people usually as a, as a lender, we are here to pro provide them growth money, money to grow their business. And we are not here to give them money to face the distress, to, to solve the distressed financial situation. So when the growth is limited and when the confidence is a little low on the, uh, because of the prevailing macro environment, this will continue for a quarter or two. This is what I reckon. Right. And uh, clearly, you know, as a strategy, we've seen that for, the com for your company, prioritization of asset quality over loan growth is something that you've looked at. And that's actually translated in one of the best in-class collection efficiency. Is this the strategy that is expected to continue as well, taking COVID into consideration? On the contrary, we'll be more circumspect on that. As, you, as, as I uh, uh, shared with you earlier, that will be more more stringent and more circums. I use the word circumspect. We'll be more circumspect uh, on our dictum of exceeding credit where it is due. So yeah. this is the time whereby we will use all our learning of all this more than two decades and see to that that how we can contain the quality of the assets within the range what we can absorb. We are not in the business of avoiding risk. We are in the business of managing risk. And hence, risk is inevitable. But to what extent it really really creates and uh, creates loss losses for the company on a loss given default and what are your capacities within the yield matrix to absorb it is very important. So mm -hmm. we are going to work within these parameters and so far I'm happy to share with you that we have been we have been very successful in containing the risk within the yield matrix. Right and uh, clearly with this by when do you see growth and ROE expansion back to pre-COVID levels? Difficult to time it, say. Uh, I, I, I can't, uh, if you would ask me the same question in first week of March, I would have told we are back to normal. Because we, we were going uh, uh, absolutely normal on disbursements, the things were good on collections. So if you ask me today, I think that I, I don't have answer to this, but optimistically and from the judgment what we can make from the, the, from the information what we gather, I think things will start normalizing from Q2 onwards progressively. And having learned our lessons not once, twice, I think mm -hmm. we'll be in a very, we'll be in a good position to counter any unfortunate third wave, which I be, wish it never happens. But in such a manner that there's not a large scale disruption on livelihood and life. Right. And, and with this, Mr. Gandhi, you've said that as far as possible, the company will avoid doing restructuring and will prefer those accounts to slip. What's the reason for the same? So let me take you to the fundamental of restructuring. Restructuring is for the ones who have a temporary disruption in their cash flow. Mm -hmm. And given a time, they can recoup, they can, they can repay the loans, what they, uh, the, what they have taken or where they have lagged behind. And hence, their credit history is not spoiled. This is how I see the restructuring. Now, on evaluation, if we find that in near future, the cash flows will not be restored and this account is going to come under stress, just restructuring right now will be building up and stress in the known stress in the book. So rather than just kicking the cane on the, the NPS, we would rather opt to restructure very optimally. Having said that, we are open and we will encourage restructuring for all the ones who can to demonstrate that the cash flows will be normal within the stipulated time. But for the ones where our judgment is that these cash flows are disturbed for a longer period of time, and might result longer to, into longer period for recovery, would rather like them to be recognized in the category they fall into. That will give us an opportunity to provide adequately and thus make the balance sheet stronger and create less stress on the balance sheet. Right. So overall, with regards to where the asset quality is concerned, uh, what do you make of it, at least in the first year in, in FY22 as a whole? See, ideally, it is, uh, we can give a range bound number. Last time when I shared with all of you, I always used to share that it will be anywhere between 1.5 to 2% in GNPS mm -hmm. and 1 to 1.5 in NNPS. Uh, uh, I, would not like, uh, with, I would not like to uh, take the credit of being proved correct. But on the contrary, I give the credit to my borrowers who stood by our assumptions. And they, they took a lot of pains in repaying the loans regularly. And we could end up at around 1.5% of NNPS as per mm -hmm. our target. And now with the second second COVID wave where things were getting normalized. And let me share with you, this zigzag normalization hurts more 
that once the things are normalized and then again it closes and then again you have to take it takes a lot of energy to gain momentum correct so again we'll have to account for a marginal rise in gnps and nnps and we are uh, we are well prepared with buffer provisioning and a very strong capital base hmm so so with this you know in terms of the different segments of business that the company operates in as well where are you seeing higher traction from your own because uh, uh, micro enterprise loans is something which you've been concentrating on sme loans is probably picking up as well cvs and two wheelers probably is a little dilly dally right now taking into consideration the kind of auto sales numbers that are coming in Uh, so that will take time uh, as you know that the wheels portfolio will take time to uh, really come back to normal uh, while uh, having said that we have a uh, we have a smaller wheels portfolio in our overall aum which is less than 10 15% so for us on a lower base we might see some growth on the wheels portfolio with our more focus going there once the economy normalizes there yeah. and on the micro and the sme front the demand will be there it is up to us that what qualifies for a disbursement and hence addition to the eu so once again it all depends upon normalization the traction for demand will be there but the million dollar question is that to how much of the ones who opt for credit really deserve it from our risk perspective right and in terms of geographies uh, where do we plan to expand because we have strong presence with regards to where south is concerned west is concerned and even some parts to the north any expansion plans to go towards the north eastern side of the country see currently uh, through a direct distribution we have 3500 centers uh, in the western part uh, south we are we are to explore fully so we would like to penetrate more in all the, um, in the states where we are already present in So current year, I think we will not be expanding to other states, but we'll be penetrating deep in the states where we are working, like South Maharashtra, Rajasthan, MP, and also Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And having said that, we have a unique distribution system whereby we work with more than 100 NBFCs because we personally believe that the people who we serve uh, are so informal to have extended credit where it is due. it is the people closest to the ground who are strongest so with association with all such nbfcs it gives us almost a pan india presence whereby gradually we will be increasing our own direct presence also uh, from time to time okay and with regards to by the cost of borrowing go the last quarter we were at around 8.75 and the leverage ratio is around 3.12 times is this something that we will be maintaining going ahead or do you think we could better it in the coming quarters uh it all it all depends upon the, how the interest rate moves uh, the, as i talked to you currently there is sufficient liquidity available for companies like us who have a good track record and a good uh, rating uh, for them liquidity is available so i have reasons to believe that we'll be in a position to maintain or improve uh, on the borrowing cost and in terms of uh, leverage i think we are already uh, less than optimally leveraged we see ourselves leveraging anywhere between three to four times okay and with regards to where the aum growth goes if you have to look at the next 2 to 3 years do you think we will be able to maintain the 37% chgr that we have been seeing so far or do you think there could be a slight dip taking covid into consideration so coming to the historical 37% chgr it uh, it looks 37 because it started with a very lower base correct uh, if you say in the, next, in the last 5 years or if you take as last 10 years view it would be anywhere between 25 to 30 and i say that if things normalizes i see no reason why we will not be in a position to be in a range of 20 to 30% growth we uh, give a few percentage here or there and there are very strong enablers for there as far as we are concerned a very huge market size very strong capitalization very strong capabilities to raise the, the debt and the niche expertise in the segment whom we are working with more than two and a half decades of expertise and with a very strong management team we are one of the strongest consistent management team uh, i personally believe that in the lending business internal risk is far more better than the external is far more than the external risk so we have the advantage of having a senior management team who is with the company since an on average of more than 10 years so this is a very very unique advantage to us and with all these strong enablers i personally believe that once thing normalizes we see no reason why we should not grow at our original levels of around say average of 25% right 
and very lastly mr gandhi with regards to where uh, affordable housing finance segment is considered uh, how big a focus is that going to be for the company i said uh, in the analysis meeting yesterday that uh, affordable housing finance within the next 3 to 5 years is going to contribute very meaningfully to the groups uh, aum groups profitability mm-hmm. Uh, having said that, uh, I must admit that uh, we have not grown our book uh, in the manner we would have liked to because of the various reasons. While I consider complaint is a domain of the week, but I, I will at the same time like to highlight few of the things which had played out over all these years, which has restricted us from uh, growing the way we want to grow in the housing finance uh, business and how it is settling slowly. From uh, starting from a very unhealthy competition, whereby some unrealistic things were happening in the market. to ilfs and to start with if i take you if if i take you back beyond that the uh, we were focused on the affordable space and at that time supply was the constraint mm. we along with monitor group and other other groups used to go and convince the developers to enter the affordable space because not many developers were ready to enter the developer space so right in starting from that phase to the macro crisis which has which now we are saying it's, it's settling in many ways Where, whereby the prudence has now prevailed among the housing finance companies on how to land uh, and and how to have the right interest uh, rate offering to the customers to lot of supply and with the supply the developers rationalizing their prices which they were they were never ready to do it in the past they would hold on to the price irrespective of whatever the inventory they hold so all those things have changed a lot and a company by very strong capitalization if you see our housing finance company is capitalized at at 42% so we have at, at the same capital level i have i, I have room to to double or triple my book without adding the capital and add to that our internal accruals from time to time so yeah. we have very strong enablers to grow this book but with the same dicting extending credit where it is due evident from the fact that our housing finance has 0.26% uh, net stage 3 apa and with a covid buffer of 1.25% so there also the balance sheet strength is very strong it is just a matter of time from where we can pick up on growth and with a lower base we will see a growth of 30 35% for coming years and within next 3 to 5 years it should start contributing very meaningfully right so looking forward to this kind of growth story as well thank you mr gandhi so much for joining us on the show always a pleasure to speak to you thank you, thank you. stay safe and speak to you soon again Thank you, thank you. You also stay safe.